Hello and welcome. Today we are going to be talking about post-operative nausea and vomiting. So first of all, let's just establish why we need to know this. And it's because 20% of people will experience post-operative nausea and vomiting after surgery. That is one in five people. And shockingly, after laparoscopic surgery, that risk increases to 75%. So now we are looking at three out of four people who had laparoscopic surgery who will have postoperative nausea and vomiting. And lastly, because feeling like this is just plain nasty. And if you can prevent it or treat it, you will be your patient's hero. So let's look at the risk factors for postoperative nausea and vomiting. And there's a score called the Apfel score. Now, Apfel was the guy's name, but Apfel is also the German word for apple, hence why this picture. Now, there are four risk factors that are consistently proven to be associated with postoperative nausea and vomiting, and that is being of the female sex, being a non smoker having a, a history of motion sickness or of previous post-operative nausea and vomiting. And then if you're going to have post-operative opioids, all of that are risk factors for post-operative nausea and vomiting. And then if we look at the risk factors, we can stratify the risk. Now, if you have no risk factors, you still have a 10% risk of um, developing post-operative nausea and vomiting. And if you have one risk factor, that's 20%. If you have two risk factors, 40%, 3 risk factors, 60 4 80%. So if you are a woman who is a non-smoker and you get a bit motion sick when you drive in a car or when you fly, then you have a 60% chance of developing post-operative nausea and vomiting. Um, so, and even if you're a young guy and you're a non-smoker, you still have a 40% risk. So that's quite significant. So it means that we do really need to look after our patients from this point of view and make sure that we give them some prevention if they do not experience this uncomfortable um, side effect after their surgery. Now, let's take it back to the basics. Vomiting is a complex process. You may remember from medical school that there are two areas in the brain that control nausea and vomiting. Now, to be quite honest, that is about all that I could remember from medical school days. So let's look at where these two places are and what they do and what their roles are. So this may ring a bell to you. Um, and the area that we are interested in is the brain stem, specifically the medulla oblongata. So let's zoom into that. And you can see here a small area marked in red, um, and that is the chemoreceptive trigger zone, or the CTZ. Note that the CTZ is outside the blood-brain barrier, and that's quite important in terms of its function. We'll come to that later. The second center that we're interested in is the vomiting center, and that's this blue area in the middle of the pons within the so-called reticulum formation. Now, I like to look things up as I go along. Um, so just for interest sake, this reticular formation is a group of about 100 nuclei in the brainstem that are connected with one another. Now the word reticular means net-like. So whenever you hear the word reticular, remember that it means that the structure has a net-like appearance. So let's draw that in. Let's do that. And as you can see here, you can almost imagine the nuclei in the middle and then little axons going to different nuclei um, connecting them to one another. Right? And there are projections from this group of nuclei to many other parts of the brain. The nuclei of the vomiting center obviously form a part of the reticular formation, and so does the vestibular nuclei, which I'm going to mark here in pale yellow. There we go. And the different nuclei in the reticular formation manage all of those automatic functions that we don't have to think about to stay alive. Things like breathing, balance, waking up, and then vomiting, which can be a life-saving reflex if you ate something poisonous. Now, one other structure that I want us to take note of in here is the nucleus tractus solitarius. It's the small purple area behind the CTZ. And as the name suggests, this is an isolated group of fibers with a nucleus that is not structurally related 
to the reticular formation. The NTS is important because our vagal afferent fibers pass through here on the way to the CTZ and the vomiting center. And when the CTZ sends a message to the vomiting center, that message passes through the NTS. Okay, so that's enough of a detour. Let's get back to the matter at hand. Right, so let's look at how the vomiting reflex works. So we're going to look at all the afferents that are stimulating the CTZ and the vomiting center. And this is our brain stem, and those are the nuclei and the centers that we were talking about. And I'm just going to make that a little bit bigger for us. There we go. Now, first of all, the first stimulus that we're going to look at is from the vagus, right? And that comes from your GIT. And the vagus nerve carries sympathetic afferent fibers to the nucleus tractus solitarius from where it will stimulate both the chemotrigger receptor zone and the vomiting center. Right. The next input comes from the vestibular, um, comes from vestibular stimulation. So that's from, um, from your middle ear, your inner ear, where your balance is generated. And those impulses are carried on the vestibular cochlear nerve to the vestibular nuclei in the reticular formation. And that then sends messages both to the CTZ and the vomiting center. Next, and this is where it's important that the CTZ is outside the blood-brain barrier because that allows um, emetogenic chemicals that are in the blood to trigger the CTZ. And I've, I've made the CTZ here with, little, um, with a little broken line that you can see that it is outside the blood-brain barrier. And as we said, that is so that these um, emetogenic chemicals can stimulate the CTZ, the, the CTZ. There we go. And then lastly, we have the higher centers. Um, so this is impulses coming from the cortex um, and things like fear and anxiety and memory and smell. All of those things that if you um, smell something in particular that kind of triggers a nauseating feeling or if you feel very tense. Um, and you then start to feel nauseous. That's, this is why, because your higher centers send an impulse directly to the vomiting center. Okay, so now all these impulses have come in, so what happens next? Well, first of all, the chemotrigger receptor zone is going to send all of the impulses that it got through the, through the nu uh, nucleus tractus solitarius to the vomiting center. And then the vomiting center does the final processing and what the vomiting center then does is to send efferent messages back to the GIT through cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, 10, and 12. Right. So let's just take it back um, a little bit more diagrammatically. Um, so we're going to look at exactly the same process, just more in a diagrammatic fashion. So first of all, as we said, we have our chemotrigger receptor zone. I've marked it again with a, um, with a broken line that we can see it's outside the blood-brain barrier. And then inside the blood-brain barrier is your nucleus tractus solitarius, your vomiting center, and your vestibular nuclei. So what triggers the CTZ? So centrally acting in metagenic substances, and this can be drugs like morphine and digitalis, or it can be GIT chemicals. Um, and then estrogens, both exogenous and endogenous. So this is why women taking contraceptives sometimes get nauseous and also why um, when women are pregnant, um, they can become um, nauseous. And then any other endogenous toxins. So um, when you are uremic or when you are in DKA or if there are any radiation breakdown products, all of these chemicals lead to a chemical stimulation of the CTZ and the CTZ of course then sends its message through the nucleus tractus solitarius to the vomiting center. What else stimulates the vomiting center? So we have all our visceral impulses. So this can be um, after you had an MI that there are some impulses through the vagus nerve going to the vomiting center or um, diseases of the GIT or the biliary tract or if there's irritation of the peritoneum or even if there's irritation of the urinary tract. And this is why um, children, if they get UTIs, they can present with nausea and vomiting. Um, or if the stomach or the duodenum is irritated or stretched. 
that then sends a message to the MTS, which sends a message to the CTZ and, and the vomiting center. And as we said already, all the impulses from the um, CTZ eventually end up going to the vomiting center as well. And then your higher centers that directly stimulate the vomiting center. And then lastly, vestibular stimulation, motion sickness, if you have benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, um, or Meniere's disease, all of these stimulate the vestibular nuclei, which stimulate the CTZ and the vomiting center. And there you go. So how can we block these impulses? And we're going to look at the receptors in a moment, but just basically, the vomiting center impulses can be blocked by anti-muscarinic drugs with atropine-like side effects, and we'll see why in a moment. So your first-generation antihistamines play a role here, things like promethazine. And then your CTZ is blocked by metoclopramide and the phenothiazines. Right, so I hope that these two schematic um, explanations of how the impulses work have kind of helped you guys. Feel free to go back and just look at it again just to get a clearer picture of it if you, if you need to. Now I'm going to do a little, oh, and the last thing was that the vestibular nuclei gets blocked by antimuscarinics and first-generation antihistamines, but we'll look at this in a moment. So I'm going to take just a little detour now, um, because you saw that I marked phenothiazines with a little asterisk. And as I said, I like to look things up when I don't know about them. And I remember as a medical student hearing the word phenothiazine derivative quite a lot. You know, this drug is a phenothiazine derivative. And I must say that term never really meant anything to me. Um, and now that I looked it up, now I know. So I just wanted to share that with you so that you will also be demystified. So we're just going to look at the chemical structure here. Now, phenothiazines are chemicals that were used as a pesticide in the 1930s before DDT was developed. But it's a bit of a problem if your um, pesticide is broken down by sunlight and air. Not really ideal for outdoor crops, so it was abandoned. But then people seem to like this chemical because in the 1940s it was repurposed and it was found that it's also a, a good deworming agent that was used both for, um, for humans and for livestock. And then for some other reason people kept on researching this drug and or this chemical and then in the 1950s, they found that the derivatives of the of the phenothiazines um, can be very useful for treating allergies and psychiatric conditions. Goodness knows why these two conditions go together, but there you have it. So the phenothiazine derivatives have tails connected to the parent com compound. And it's this side chain that determines the function. Now, there are papyrazine side chains. Um, and these include cyclozine and prochlorpyrazine. So there's one old antihistamine and one antipsychotic here. And then there's also aliphatic side chains. And from this side, you have promethazine and chlorpromazine, another antihistamine and antipsychotic. All right. And then there's one more phenothiazine derivative that we actually know, and that is methylene blue, a dye that is often used in... Um, in medicine. Um, so now we know what a phenothiazine derivative is. Just a little, little detour. I hope that that clarifies something for you. Now let's go back to nausea and vomiting and we're going to be looking now at the different receptors that, um, that are involved in the nausea and vomiting process. So here they are. Um, dopamine, acetylcholine, serotonin, um, H1 histamine receptors, your cannabinoid 1 receptor, and your neurokinin 1 receptor. So how are we going to remember this? And there's a nice little acronym I'm going to share with you. So the first four um, receptors spell the word DASH if you take the D from dopamine, the A from acetylcholine, H from serotonin, and the H from histamine. And then we're going to, if you need to vomit, you must make a DASH for the can, so cannabinoid and neurokinin, okay? Now why the can? So you're making a dash for the can. Now it's either the trash can that you can vomit into, or in the States they talk about the toilet as a can, and you can go vomit in the toilet as well. So if you need to vomit, you need to make a dash for the can. 
And if you remember back, then you'll remember the receptors involved in nausea and vomiting. So let's look where they are located. So we're going to go back to this little picture that we looked at earlier. And the first um, receptor we're going to look at is the receptors in the cortex. Now you have one cortex, one brain, and you have one receptor that goes there, and that's the cannabinoid receptor. So it's quite nice. The C from cortex goes with C from cannabinoid. There's one cortex, therefore it's cannabinoid one. All right. The next one is what's happening in the vestibular center. Now my little memory aid here is the constant humming in my ears can make me sick. So if you have tinnitus, you may get so sick of it that you want to vomit. And here we are going to use the H from histamine receptor. And I'm not going to use the A from acetylcholine, but acetylcholine receptors can be muscarinic receptors. So humming H and M will make you think about the histaminergic and the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Then the next one is in the gut, we have serotonin, cannabinoid, and neurokinin receptors. And my memory aid here is, if I were to drink five HT cans of beer, I will want to vomit. I'm a bit of a lightweight. Well, maybe not. Five beers is quite a lot. So five HT, so here we're using the five from the serotonin um, receptor, 5-HT can, K from cannabinoid and N from neurokinin, 5-HT cans of beers, cans of beer, I will want to vomit. There we go. Now the CTZ scans all of the input that comes into it before sending the message to the vomiting center. So we're going to build the word scanned here. And here we're going to use the S from the serotonin receptor, the C from cannabinoid, A from acetylcholine, N from neurokinin, and D from dopaminergic. So you can see these five receptors are in the CTZ. And then lastly, in the vomiting center, you have all the receptors except dopamine. So you can either remember it like that, that you have all the receptors except dopamine, or you can make the, the acronym ASHCAN. So um, you can think of um, the black bins that we have that often say no hot ash. Um, so ash can, yeah, if that helps you. Okay, so I hope that that helps a little bit to remember it. Um, it has helped me, I must tell you. It's a bit of a thing to remember the, the mnemonics and the acronyms, but it does actually make a difference. So I hope that that helps. So now let's look at what works where. So we're going to keep this picture, and I'm just going to put up one of the one of the um, one of the drugs, and that is metoclopramide, right? So I've marked metoclopramide in yellow and red because these are the receptors that it stimulates. Good. Now I remember being taught that metoclopramide is a prokinetic. And because it empties the stomach, stomach therefore you will vomit less. So I never thought that it was that effective as an anti-nausea medication. But actually, I was completely wrong. Metoclopramide does have prokinetic effects, and that's through the peripheral dopaminergic receptors in the, in the gut. Um, but it also has antidopaminergic effects centrally in the CTZ. And it has serotogenergic effects too. So it will have an effect on the CTZ and the vomiting center, um, and, when, and it will also um, have an effect on the, on the serotogenergic receptors in the GIT. So let's draw all of that in. So it works on all three places. And the other nice thing about metoclopramide is that its onset of action when given IV is within three minutes. The only downside to metoclopramide is that it can cross the blood-brain barrier and therefore it can cause extrapyramidal side effects. So, and you should avoid it in patients with Parkinsonism. Um, in high doses, metoclopramide is also a cardiac suppressant. And there is an alternative called domperidone, which is also a dopamine antagonist, 
and it does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so um, no dystonia. The downside of domperidone, though, is that its bioavailability is only 17%, and it can cause dysrhythmias. So I would probably prefer to use metoclopramide. I'm more familiar with it. But just be aware that in um, younger patients and in older patients, you may get um, extrapyramidal side effects, and you don't want to use it in older patients with Parkinsonism. Okay, so we can see here where it's working. Let's look at the next one. Ah, there was strong peridone. I forgot that I, that I added that in. <laughs> okay, so next we're going to look at promethazine. So promethazine I've marked in blue and red because it works on acetylcholine and dopamine receptors. Right? Now, what is promethazine? Promethazine is an old antihistamine, a first-generation antihistamine. And as we learned earlier, it is a phenothiazine derivative related to some of the early antipsychotic medications. So from this, we can kind of figure out one of the side effects, and that is that it will cause sleepiness and sedation. And because it is an antihistamine, we can work out that it will probably have the effect of motion sickness because um, it will work on histaminergic receptors. There we go. All right. Um, and then, because these old type of antihistamines were very dirty drugs, we see that they have activity at dopaminergic and, and, and muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Um, and it's a, an antagonist of these receptors in both the vomiting center and the CTZ. There we go. So it's blocking the vestibular um, uh, nuclei through the histaminergic um, responses and your vomiting center and your CTG, C, CTZ through muscarinic and dopaminergic receptors. So that's fantastic. Right. Um, but because... It's such an old drug and such a dirty drug, and it works in so many different places. And because we have muscarinic um, receptors or um, acetylcholine receptors all over the body, we tend to see quite a lot of side effects. Um, so besides just the sleepiness um, from promethazine, um, you can also get anticholinergic effects. And we're going to make another little detour now just to look at what anticholinergic side effects mean, because that's also something that you hear a lot of, and you must be able to like remember what, to, what, um, what, they, what they are. Now, I found this um, very nice drawing from sketchymedicine.com. You see there, see their little logo there. So let's go through it quickly. First of all, you can get hot as a hair. Um, because your body is not sweating and your body temperature therefore increases. You also become dry as a bone um, because you're not passing urine, you have urinary retention, and as we said already, you are not sweating. Um, the patients also complain of a dry mouth um, quite often. Then you can become blind as a bat because of dilated pupils, red as a beet due to facial flushing, and mad as a hatter due to central effects of anticholinergics that can cause delirium. And remember when we say anticholinergic, what we mean to say is anti-acetylcholine, right? So when promethazine blocks those muscarinic receptors, it's blocking the effect of acetylcholine. And remember, anti-acetylcholine anti, um, is the main neurotransmitter for the parasympathetic nervous system. So acetylcholine regulates all of our rest and digest functions. So if we block acetylcholine with anticholinergic, these normal rest and digest functions don't happen, and then it presents like these side effects. Okay, there's acetylcholine, just that you can remember what it looks like. Back to the drugs. Okay, so cyclizine. Cyclizine um, is sold under the brand name Valoid in South Africa. And before we had the, the 5-HT3 serotonergic receptor blockers, this was um, used quite a bit for children with vomiting. So I've marked it blue and purple because it also works on acetylcholine and histaminergic receptors. 
Um, and you will remember that, pro that cyclazine, like promethazine, is an odor antihistamine and it is a phenothiazine derivative, just on the papyrazine side chain side. So cyclazine is an um, antagonist of the H1 receptors, therefore blocking the vestibular nuclei um, and partly the vomiting center. And it's also an antagonist of the, of the muscarinic receptors, um, therefore blocking the vomiting center further. And it also blocks impulses of the CTZ. So there we can see that. Um, and cyclazine is also a little bit sedating, less so than promethazine. And like promethazine, it also has some nice anticholinergic side effects that we know all about now. Okay, the next one is ondansetron. Now, ondansetron and granisetron are two examples of the new 5-HT3 or serotonin receptor blockers. These are very effective antiemetics and they have a more favorable side effect profile than the antihistamines and the anticholinergics, right? So let's just take out all the other ones. We're just going to put in here it only works on the serotonin receptors. They were initially used extensively for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, but they are now used in daily practice too to manage nausea and vomiting related to gastroenteritis and, and in anesthesia to prevent and manage post-operative nausea and vomiting. There are different groups of serotonin receptors and the 5-HT3 blockers obviously block the 5-HT3 receptors. And these can be found in the GIT and the, key, and the CTZ and in the vomiting center. And dantotron is quite nice because it can be given orally, intravenously and also sublingually, which is very useful in children. Um, in order to prevent post-operative nausea and vomiting, it's best to give ondansetron towards the end of the operation. We must be aware, though, that it can cause dysrhythmias and it will also prolong the QT interval. So if you have somebody with long QT syndrome, you want to avoid ondansetron. One last comment about ondansetron. If you are going to prescribe tramadol to your patient for pain relief post-op, it may be better not to use ondansetron, but to use something like metoclopramide instead. Mm. Remember that tramadol has effects not only at the opioid mu receptors, but it also blocks reuptake of serotonin, which probably plays a role in its analgesic effects. So if you now go and block your 5-HG3 receptors, then you are blocking part of the effect of your tramadol. So rather use something that, like metoclopramide, which is better at blocking those chemical impulses to the CTZ in any case. Okay, so I just put a little picture here to remind us of the QT syndrome. And there's just a little picture of tramadol to remind you of that. Okay, our next drug is quite an interesting one, and that is dexamethasone. So I've marked the dexamethasone in, um, in yellow and purple because that's where we think it has an effect on the serotonergic and the neurokinin receptors. But it works in a few different ways. Um, first of all, it makes the blood-brain barrier less permeable to emetogenic substances. Secondly, it inhibits central prostaglandin synthesis. And then it also inhibits the synthesis and the, re and the release of serotonin, therefore reducing emetic stimuli. And it may also have an effect on the neurokinin receptors, as we've, as we've said already. Right, so it will work both peripherally and centrally. So it's quite useful as an antiemetic, and it's usually given in a dose of 4 mg um, IV. It's just 4 mg or 4 mg per kilogram to adults. But in addition to that, dexamethasone is also useful in pain management. In higher doses, for example, 8 mg IV to adults, it will enhance the effect of any opioids you use, therefore reducing the overall need for opioids. In terms of side effects, a once-off dose won't give you adrenal suppression, but it may increase your serum glucose transiently, just something to be aware of in the post-operative period. Right. The next drug that we are going to look at is a drug called a prepotent. 
Now, a prepotent I've marked here in purple because it works specifically on the neurokinin receptors, and it is um, a neuro, it's a, a, a an antiemetic that is used exclusively for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Um, interestingly enough, it also increases the activity of dexamethasone and 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, so it makes those work more, um, more effectively. So that's quite, quite helpful for our um, patients on, on chemo. Um, a prepotent does penetrate the blood-brain barrier, and it has a long half-life of 9 to 12 hours. Be aware that there are some cytochrome P3A4 interactions with a prepotent. And that's about all that I can tell you about it. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end. I hope that this was helpful. If you want any more information or more in-depth information, please have a look at any of these references. Okay, bye-bye.